Venam Kavam Samarangam Dvaipatam Varham Tam Samasitam Vatasun Dhamra Kandar Kaputi Kamamir Vishesha Shobam Govinda Madhi Prisham Tamaham Bajami Bhagavatamrita of Srila Sanat and Goswami Pad. The chapter 2 of the second part is entitled Gan, Knowledge. And we're still dealing with the subject matter of knowledge. Uh, now we're discussing what is the highest knowledge to be obtainable after discussing liberation, moksha. And what is liberation? Uh, we come to understand that there has to be a clarity of definition of what is meant. Uh, different ideas are there. Buddhists have one idea, Mayavadis have another idea, but the Bhaktas have still a clearer idea of what, what real or true liberation is. In fact, we consider it above liberation, but that is something that is higher than, than that which is attainable through knowledge. It is bhakti and the goal is praying. So, amongst the discussion, the various proponents of the various ideas, the Bhakti Shastras come forward. From those scriptures, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Satvata Siddhanta, and other Agamas, and the formal Shrutis, uh, they began to speak, O oh, dear one who have achieved the post of Brahma, this topic is more secret than a rare treasure. <clears throat> but we shall explain it to you because your good abundant qualities inspire us to speak. It is stated that one should um, uh, develop good positive qualities in one's life so that one can uh, actually endear oneself to the Vaishnavas and to the spiritual master and like that. Um, Gopa Kumar has attained the, to the post of Brahma. And they're impressed with him because he's sincere in his effort. He's always chanting attentively his mantra that his guru has given to him. And he's sincerely inquiring, not just a... Uh, casual inquiry. He wants to know. If you want to know something, then it says approach bona fide spiritual master. Hear from him. How? Submissively. And render service to him. And uh, in this way, pleasing him, he will inspi be inspired to impart the highest wisdom. So the Bhakti Shastras are saying now, we are pleased with you, your inquiry, your service, and like that. So we who are dedicated to the personality of Godhead's devotional service may sometimes discuss liberation, but only as a means to encourage people to reject it. <laughs> when we speak of liberation, we condemn it and everything that goes with it. 
So uh, if we study the Bhakti Shastra, Srimad Bhagavatam especially, we realize that the Vaishnava is not interested in liberation from the material world. He's interested in increased devotion to the Lord uh, to the highest degree of manifesting an actual spiritual emotion towards the Lord, uh, not in a random way or not in a uh, um, abstract way, but the devotee wants to have a relationship with the Lord, to serve the Lord in a particular mood or ras. To describe the ultimate goal of devotional service, we may sometimes speak of moksha, but we do not intend to acclaim moksha as the final goal of spiritual discipline, because, because in moksha, there is not even a trace of real happiness. Moksha in the highest understanding is a negation of one's suffering. One wants to be liberated because he's suffering. And so he, uh, or he realizes that the world is suffering, birth, death, old age, disease, everywhere he looks, they, they're suffering. So he wants to obtain uh, liberation. But the devotee isn't motivated by the negative, he's motivated by the positive. And that is uh, the personality of Godhead and his relationship with Krishna. The so-called happiness of liberation may be compared to the happiness of not being sick or the enjoyment of deep sleep. That is, if one's sick, one wants to gain relief from that sickness. If one uh, finds oneself uh, suffering, then one may think, hey, let me just enter into some slumber and forget all of this. In fact, that's what uh, drug addicts do. Because the world is so much suffering to them, they want to uh, forget the world. And so they become uh, involved in, in drugs that put them into deep states of illusion or sleep like that. In fact, the term liberation is a misnomer created by illusion, and it appeals only to the ignorant. For even a shadow of the Lord's name, if one somehow chants them once, or if they merely enter the ears, liberation is easily attained. If we understand that liberation is uh, released from the cycle of birth and death, let's go with that definition. Liberation is the release from the cycle of birth and death. Then, even the mere shadow of the Lord's name, uh, meaning Namabas, that, that is the situation of Ajamil. He chants, calling out for his son when he sees the messengers of death coming towards him. And he says, Narayan, Narayan. Uh, but he's calling out for his son. He's fearful. Death is coming. But the Vishnu Dutas or the messengers of the Lord hear that and they hear, oh, someone is calling for our Lord, so we must come and, and take him to the uh, higher destination, like that. So that is called Namabas or shadow of the name. It's not chanting in, in devotion, but even that shadow of a name when referring to something else, or even if the, sometimes it says the syllables are reversed. Um, uh, there's a situation where there was one hunter that uh, I believe it was Narada Muni instructed him to chant Ram and he couldn't do it because he was so impure. So he said chant Mara, which is death, Mara. But when the s symbols are put together, Mara, Mara, then it becomes Rama, Rama. So even reverse symbols, <laughs> that is another type of indirect chanting. But it has so much power that sometimes even the the uh, uh, spiritual master like Nardas tells a, such an impure person, chant uh, in this way. It may be impure, but at least you'll gain freedom from this cycle of birth and death. So e even if it merely enters the ears, it is said here, Mahaprabhu's uh, Maha Nam Sankirtan was to benefit people so that the Nam would enter their ears. When we go on Harinam, we're going out on the street, it's entering people's ears. Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare. They hear it. They don't know what it is. But actually, it is the beginning of the end 
of the cycle of birth and death for them. That's uh, the merciful nature of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Some, some Brahmins used to say, one should only chant silently. But Mahaprabhu said, no, we should chant loudly and clearly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Why? So others can hear it. And it was described that even the plants and even the animals and any, the insects, anyone who comes in contact with that vibration benefits. And what is the benefit? First thing is here, cessation of birth and death. That means their, their, their samsara is coming to an end. Somehow that seed, their good fortune is that material life is coming to an end for them. It may take a while for them to get there, but still, I mean, they may not come and become full-time devotee or anything, but it begins with something. We call that sukriti, good fortune, that comes in a way that even is a get, unknowing, somehow or other, you've gotten that good fortune. Okay. So here it says, even a shadow of the Lord's name, if somehow is chanted even once or merely enters the ear, liberation is easily attained freedom from the cycle of birth and death. Liberation, please understand, is attractive to those whose discrimination is poor. That is, for those who don't understand the reality of the nature of the personality of Godhead and don't accept God in a uh, personal form, they know nothing but uh, this type of negative liberation. They don't identify God as a person, but they identify him as a force or a quality, but they don't know him as a person. So they have poor understanding. Uh, and so their goal is also uh, not clear, what they want to achieve in life. And if they do a cessation of birth and death, then their idea of moksha is cloudy also. Moksha is the removal of all misery the stopping of illusory activities, or the self-realization that comes from abandoning the false identities created by Maya. This is true liberation. When one actually achieves liberation, uh, there is a clarity of one's identity. Here it says, abandoning the false identities created by Maya. Material nature uh, forces us to identify with the body, but the first thing, you know, Srila Prabhupada taught, we are not this body, then who are we? We're the eternal servants of Krishna, like that. When one understands that and one uh, focuses his, his path on achieving that uh, divine service, then, of course, he comes to the platform where he's uh, no longer feeling the miseries of, of material life because he's stopping all illusory activities. He's living a life of reality, a real life, a real, <laughs> because he's connected with that which is real. Everything else is illusion. If you live in a world that you're identified with illusion, then you live in an illusion and it's full of misery. But if you live in a life of reality in the service of the Lord, then naturally everything becomes clear and all the positives uh, uh, are automatically obtained. The happiness that arises from directly perceiving the true identity of the jiva soul, the entity composed of eternity, knowledge, and bliss, is also meager. That is, simply to know that I am not this body, but I am a particle of the Supreme, uh, oh, with the qualities of eternity, knowledge, and bliss, that's, that's an impersonal idea of the self also. And that just to realize that is not enough. That entity, that reality of pure self, is called Brahman, but it is devoid of qualities. Uh, there are two aspects of God, Godhead with qualities and Godhead without qualities, that is, his energy spreading everywhere. Whom would we rather identify with? The Supreme Personality of Godhead is called the Supreme Brahman, the Super Soul, the absolute controller of everything, his body is the concentrated essence of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. He is an ocean of superlative qualities. 
He is the personality of Godhead. Bhagavan, his reference here is Bhagavan to Parma Brahma. That whom we call the Par Brahman or the impersonal is actually Bhagavan. It's his energy which is extending, just like we would be identified, oh, I'm in the sun, but you're in the presence of the sunlight, not the sun itself. Like Contrary natures, like having qualities and having no qualities, can join in him. Someone may think, well, how can God have qualities and no qualities? Well, everything is there within the Supreme. He pervades everything through his impersonal energy. Uh, we may call that the Brahma Jyoti, divine light, like that. He pervades everything. He's within every atom. He's within the heart of all living beings. And yet he is the personality of Godhead engaged in transcendental pastimes in the spiritual world, in Vaikuntha uh, and beyond. I say beyond because the Lord has other abodes beyond Vaikuntha, the uh, divine Ayodhya and the divine uh, Dwarka and the divine Braj, Vrindavan, like that. Now there's a description of that personality of Godhead, Bhagavan. His two beautiful lotus feet therefore embody the concentrated essence of happiness. And those who realize him through pure devotion surely attain that intense bliss. The two feet of Krishna are considered like a piece of sugar because they are joyful, a source of all joy. Brahman, however, may be considered joyful, but it is Krishna who is the source of all joy. Joy may be identified in different ways. One may feel joyful doing this or doing that, but Krishna is the source of all joy, and he is this complete embodiment of joy. Whatever joy we experience may be uh, said to be a, coming from the Supreme, but the highest joy is found within him, and those who are close to him experience the highest joy. I mean, if you think of Vrindavan and all those who surround him, uh, the gopis, the cowherd boys, Mother Jashoda, like that, uh, the, even the, the trees and the grass and the, uh, and the uh, uh, birds and the bees and everything like that, they're all experiencing the highest joy because they're close to that very source of joy. Brahma, we know, when he came to realize that uh, through experience, uh, he prayed to become a blade of grass in Vrindavan. If I could only become that, then I could be identified with Krishna and live close to him, the very source of joy. If the identity of the jiva or the individual soul were the same as God, then the jiva would be the full embodiment of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. And that would make him the personality of Godhead. Is the living being God? That's certainly a, a, a misnomer to consider that we are all God. Some people profess this philosophy, but they're suffering material life. So how is it that this is your choice as God to live in this condition? <laughs> no, we have to identify we are part of God, but uh, we are not God. We have qualities similar to God as the spark has the same quality as the fire. But uh, our real happiness is the closer we get to the Lord in our devotion, the happier we will experience the, because full happiness is experienced in the presence of the Lord who is the source of all happiness. The jivas are recognized as integral parts of the personality of Godhead. They are like the network of light that shines forth from the dense mass of light called the sun. In relation to the Supreme Lord, the eternally existing jivas are distinct, like rays of the sun, sparks of a fire, waves of an ocean. And these examples have so, so many times we have given before. Therefore, saintly authorities consider the jivas both different and non-different from the Supreme. Therefore, Mahaprabhu's philosophy is termed Achintya Bheda Bheda Tatra. There is a, an inconceivable simultaneous oneness and distinction. 
Oneness in the sense of the qualities of the jiva are like that of the supreme, like the spark that comes from the fire. But we are distinct also because we have a particular nature. Uh, the whole subject matter of ba uh, Bhakti no Thakur is Jaiva Dharma, is to under understand the true nature of the jiva. And when we understand that, that is understood as our true dharma or our true nature, uh, which is one of prem or divine love towards the supreme in a particular uh, expression of love, ras. Therefore, saintly authorities consider the jivas both different and non-different from the supreme. The original forms of the jiva are made of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. But by the beginningless illusion of Krishna's maya, the jivas have forgotten their true identities and wandered, deluded within the cycle of birth and death. We are of the nature of the Supreme, but because of our con contact with this illusory energy, we forget our true identities and wander from birth to birth to birth, acting out uh, different desires and, and so forth, and thus becoming further and further entangled. Thus, we, the living being suffers the torments of material lack, uh, existence, lacking the taste for loving exchanges in true spiritual life. Seekers of liberation profusely glorify liberation, just as persons aspiring for heaven praise heaven. Uh, according to the Veda, heaven is a uh, abode that gives Great joy in the beginning, but at the end, we have to come back to the earthly realm. Um, so the highest degree indicates greatness that has reached its ultimate fact, excuse me, ultimate peak. But in fact, that endless happiness has no limit. Only in devotional service does the highest degree of happiness arise. That happiness is the right reward for those who practice serving the Supreme Lord's all blissful lotus feet. And it's interesting here. Sadhana, practice. Uh, one has to practice serving the Lord's lotus feet. In the material world, we're giving, given the opportunity to practice how to serve. So we can properly develop the... Uh, uh, correct mentality for serving, so that, such as like practicing, uh, we want to glorify Krishna. We can't glorify Krishna like the gopis of the spiritual world. Uh, the, the, they may dress him and, and dance with him and do different things, but we're in practice. It's kind of like the training session or the uh, uh, learning session, the education uh, time of our life. How to serve Krishna. The spiritual master gives us opportunity. How to serve Krishna, what to do. Chant like this, uh, worship like this. This is all called sadhana or the practice of serving. And once we begin to practice, we begin to awaken something deep within us, which is our natural state of existence the highest degree of happiness begins to awaken. It's kind of like a, a flower opening. It begins to bud and begins to open like that. So that happiness increases endlessly. It is limitless and supremely great in contrast to the happiness of Brahman found in liber liberation, which never increases as it is limited. So in this way, uh, the, the Shastra says, we fully approve of this philosophical idea called Veda Veda, simultaneous oneness and difference. Indeed, when it is presented with logical argument, everything is understood and is becomes certain and irrefutable. In fact, you know, no one can actually refute this philosophy presented before anyone, uh, the highest philosophy of Krishna consciousness cannot be refuted. It makes logical sense. And uh, we encourage people to try to then take up the practice 
after understanding it. If you've accepted it in your heart uh, through logic that this is the highest thing, I've never heard anything greater than this, uh, then, then what should I do? You should begin. Take the step forward. Begin your practice. We've been reading this also um, in our readings that now that I've understood what should I do, Bhakti Nath Thakur's Jaiva Dharma continues like this. Someone is listening to the Siddhanta, the philosophy. Okay, but this is all philosophy. How do I achieve it? Okay, then that is called Abhideya, the practice, the sadhana. So there's the first is the understanding of the philosophy, then is the practice of the philosophy, actually putting it into practice, and then achieving its final goal. So in this way, uh, the Bhakti Shastras are instructing Gopa Kumar in the true understanding uh, of the wisdom of the scriptures. And this, that, that is the highest. There may be other things that may distract us even within the Shastra, but the highest purport of all the Shastra, that's why Prabhupada called Bhagavad Gita as it is. There are even translations of Bhagavad Gita where the uh, author or the translator wants to redirect the, the thinking of the person away from Krishna into karma, or into gan, into impersonal liberation, into piety, all of this. Uh, some people use the Gita to instruct in this way, but Prabhupada said, no, Bhagavad Gita as it is. The Gita teaches us to surrender to Krishna, Sarodharma, Purja, Jamma, Mikam, Sharanam, Purja. This is the beginning of our spiritual life. Surrender to Krishna and act in that understanding. And then as Prabhupada used to say, go back home, back to God.